uh, on proper inheritance. And as I mentioned before we started filming, uh, the first session has nothing to do with inheritance whatsoever, but I think it's good material, good background material. So come on in. <clears throat> I just recently gave a talk similar to this at the ACCU in Bristol, and it seemed to go OK. So we're going to try it again here. And with that, I will, yes, get started. All right, so there's the copyright notice, which I have to put in. So it's there for film purposes. You don't need to read it. There's also an abstract, which is good to have if you want to see if you want to listen to the talk. But since you're here, probably we don't need to read that either. So with that said, I'm going to start out with the same kind of introduction I do on most of my talks, which is to basically explain my view on, on architecture and physical design. But that's just almost irrelevant. But still, it's a brand. So I'm going to start with that. So I wrote this book in 1996 called Large Scale C++ Software Design. And ever since, I've been working on it and other aspects of it in this upcoming book, which I really seriously am trying to get out in rough this year, really seriously, really. Um, so the problem is that a large scale C++ software design has multiple dimensions. It's not just monolithic. There are many different aspects to it. And there are subtle interactions between what I call physical design and what most people would think of as design, or at least it used to be that most people thought of design as merely logical design, and the physical aspect wasn't important. I think today we know that it is important, and so it's not such a magical thing requires us to uh, modularize our large programs or our large libraries uh, into logical functionality that is then implemented in terms of fine grain physical components. Um, we have to delineate the behavior of these things in English, these, these components in English, the functionality. Um, and then we have to manage the physical dependencies that result from our implementations. So all of this hap has to happen together. And in fact, this delineating logical behavior and what it means to do that right is really the part of this that's germane to this talk. And there are numerous logical and physical rules that govern what we consider to be sound, sound software design. And um, there's a certain synergy between the two once you get to appreciate both. So the purpose of this talk, review components which I consider to be the fundamental unit of design, not classes, not functions, but components. Um, then we're going to talk about basic interfaces and contracts and what that means. Now, this is particularly interesting because right now in the C++ standard, we are getting very, very close to putting contracts into the language. Now, there's a lot to discuss on that topic. And in fact, I believe Nathan Myers has a 45 minute talk coming up. I think it's Wednesday or Thursday. I can't remember. It might be Thursday. Anyway, check. Nathan Myers is going to talk about the status of contracts. So I recommend if you're interested in contracts and what's going on, go to that talk and then talk to him after in the bar or whatever. Then there's this notion of a narrow versus a wide contract. And this is particularly important for if we want to check to see if a precondition is violated. Uh, a narrow contract is something that has preconditions. A wide contract doesn't. And it's particularly important in the context of no except because uh, for wide contracts, you're, it's perfectly fine to, to uh, have, no, have uh, no exceptions be, because there's no way to violate the precondition. But if there's a narrow contract, then there's the opportunity to do anything because it's outside of the contract. And one of the things you might want to do is throw. And if the function is narrow and no except, you have a contradiction. Or at least that's the way I see it. Again, not the purpose of the talk, but I thought I'd throw it out there. And then four, which is the second talk, second half of the talk, is to explore these basic ideas in the context of inheritance. So we did get a little bit of a late start, but I don't expect this to go over. Uh, so let's get started. Um, components. So this is my view of 
a component. It's got a logical aspect and a physical aspect. Um, the logical uh, uh, entities are circular, but uh, the, the iconography is that. And the um, physical entities are rectangular. And so you can see the two of them are together there. And logical things are like classes and functions, and physical things are like files and libraries. Right? Just for example, to get started. And we have a bunch of components, and this, this stack of components represents physical dependency. And you can think of gravity as being a force that, that uh, is, is causing this dependency to occur. The, the higher level components depend on the lower level components so they don't fall down. Right? That's the, that's the analogy. So here we have fundamentally a basic component. And I'm beeping. Um, has an implementation, it has an interface, and it has a standalone test driver. Now this is historically, it's not necessary that the test driver be standalone, but for the purposes of what we do, we use a standalone test driver. If you like Google Test and Mox and all of those things, that's fine. In order to get the kind of precision we do with the single file, which is really makes testing all about testing and not the framework, uh, you have to do a little bit more with Google Test to simulate what we do here. Here, we basically, it's just done. So um, this is our fundamental unit of design. And it's more than just a .h.cpp pair. Now, I'd really like to know, when you guys, obviously, you write C++ at some point in your life. When you deliver a, a collection of functionality, if you have .cpp files, do you not deliver corresponding .h files to go with those .cpp files? Are they usually paired one to one? Um, apparently, Everybody does that today. That's just a given. Now, how many classes you put in a component is something that people differ on. I have a bunch of rules and, 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 and things that make that very, a very precise statement. But at a minimum, if you have a .cpp, everything that you expect to be consumed externally from the CPP had better appear somewhere in the .h. I just hope that's true. OK. So we have four fundamental properties that we adhere to in addition to having .h.cpp pairs. The four properties are, the first one here, the .cpp file includes its .h file as the first substantive line of code. Does anybody want to s explain why it is that's the first substantive line? Any ideas? Why wouldn't we, yes? Well, it seems like it's, uh, since that's its, presumably it's declaration, it's, it's declaring everything that, that it's, all the, the, the rest of the file is going to be supportive of. So one reason to have it in there at all is so the code will compile. Well, yeah. OK, so that's a good answer. <laughs> Why make it first? Why first? Why not let's include IO stream and some other things? Yes, sir. Is which header file corresponds to this? Uh, OK, so what was said is it's obvious which header file corresponds to this. But if the names of the files are the same, like foo.h and foo.cpp. It used not to be the case, by the way. It used to be that the CPP files were much shorter because the archives couldn't hold names longer than 12 or 13 characters. So you'd have some nice, long, beautiful .h, and then you'd have some horrible name with all the vowels removed. <laughs> but but th that's true. That's also true. But there's one reason that, that trumps everything. The one reason is, if you make it first, there's at least one file where it's compiled in isolation hasn't seen anything else. And therefore, when you hand it off to your client, it doesn't break in their hands because of include order dependency. So that alone is reason enough. We also require that for every component, there's exactly one .h file. And in, except for a vanishingly few cases, there's exactly one .cpp file. Sometimes there's more when you want to break something up into little pieces, but that's a sign probably that you didn't factor it, or we're talking about some really critical embedded system. It doesn't happen in my company. So 1.h, 1.cpp, you include the .h in the .cpp. Now, if this talk were like the one that's going to occur at CPPCon in September, I hope, if I get accepted, uh, then I would talk about the next four. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, this is true even if there's nothing in the CPP file but the inclusion. Uh, Alistair made me put this in because everybody needs to understand that you want to make sure that that header file compiles. And um, uh, it, it turns out that, that compilers more and more are looking at templates and, and, and trying to figure out if it, it has any valid instantiation. So if it turns out that it doesn't have a valid instantiation, 
client compiler will complain sometimes. So if you want a little extra checking while you're writing the code, rather than when your client's using the code, be a really good idea to include it. So without talking about that further, here are the other three. And as I was saying, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about physical issues and advanced levelization in September. That's going to also be effectively three one-hour talks. Uh, that is the longest slide deck I have. This is mercifully short at around 550. That one is 975 slides, but it's a good talk. Unfortunately, there's a lot to talk about there that's quite different than here, so I'm not really going to talk about these other three things right now. That was a tease. Instead, I'm going to mention um, that the, the second one is really to avoid namespace pollution. The third one is really to uh, achieve the logical, physical, modularity and coherence so that when you're dealing with something logical, it's embedded in something physical. The two together work very nicely. And the last one provides a wonderful property, which is you don't have to parse all the code. All you have to look at the envelope of, of pound includes and you know the envelope of physical dependencies. Now, there might be a pound include that you don't need, and which means you have more physical dependencies than you actually have. But you can sniff that out four orders of magnitude faster than you can with something like Clang. Okay? So that's to one side. We'll talk about that in this advanced levelization technique, uh, techniques talk. All right, moving forward, I just want to, this, this is the notation that I've used uh, ever since the first book. Here I have uh, four components. One of them, you'll notice, has two classes in it. The class is private. We know this because it has an underscore in the name. Uh, I do this because I don't want to have arbitrary depth either in my physical designs or in my logical designs. So if I have a private class, it sits right next to the public class. It's not nested. When you nest things, that it gets very incestuous. So you want to know I've got this and this and what depends on what. And in this particular case, we have a, an abstract shape. We have a implementation of the shape, we have a point that's used in the interface of a polygon, e.g. to add a vertex. Uh, the shape will tell you its origin, whatever the thing is. So shape is used in the interface, but it's used in a very particular way. It's used in name only. So we'll briefly talk about that. And then uh, the last one is used in the implementation. The easiest way to think of that is if something is used in the interface, then you can tell programmatically it's going in and out of some, some method of the, of the class or, or a function. Uh, a type that's used in the interface of a function uh, is named in its signature or it's part of its return type. And then uh, a type that's used in a class uh, is, is, um, na is, is used in a member function of that class. So now, if something is used substantively, but it's not used in the interface, then we say it's used in the implementation. And then the last one is, if it's not used substantively, does not contribute to physical dependency, then it's used in name only. So those are the three symbols. So we'll put this up. I mentioned that this means that it's private. It's not allowed to be used outside the, the, the component. And this is the is a relationship. This is an important one. We're going to be talking about that in the next session. And a polygon is a shape. Easy. The next one is the users in the interface. And if you just try to picture what's going to happen here, the polygon uses the point, right? And the point list and the point list link both use the point. And the dependencies are down, right? Because the polygon knows about the point. The point does not know about the polygon. OK. Then we have the users in the implementation. And there are a couple of them. One is the polygon uses the point list. But there's also the point list uses the point list link, right? Now, the polygon using the point list is significant. The point list using the point list link isn't as important because they're already co-located in a single component. So that doesn't introduce additional physical dependencies across component boundaries. All right? Then, as I said, there's this one bizarre one. And that's shape using point in name only. Shape knows only the name point. It doesn't know what a point is. So we use this symbol. Now, once we have these symbols, we can go straight to the next level, which is deducing physical dependencies. And so, implied dependencies, right, a polygon is a shape. Polygon uses point list in its implementation. Point list and point list link use point, and polygon uses point, so we want to imagine what the dependencies are. So, depends on? Inheritance, of course, causes a dependency. It's the strongest dependency there is. It's a compile time physical dependency. So polygon uses point, 
Polygon, excuse me, point list uses point, and Polygon uses point list in its implementation. Does this make sense? We, we, you see the correlation? You may have seen this before, but I'm trying to give just sort of the, the background for some of the things that we're doing. All right, now we can turn to level numbers. And once you have the physical dependencies, you can uh, uh, discount the logical relationships and work directly off of them. If there's anything in here that doesn't depend on anything else locally, <laughs> then it's at level one. So point is at level one. Now, remember I told you shape has this funny relationship where it, it knows about point in name only? Doesn't include it? It's at level one. Only because of that strange relationship. Everything else follows the rule that if you depend on something at a given level, you're at least one higher. So th that's at level two. Now, polygon depends on something at level two and it's something at level one, so it's at level three. This is a good picture to have on your wall because you can explain very large things very quickly to people if they can see this. It's even better when it's in color. And by color, I mean it turns out that there's another talk uh, which talks about the different uh, uh, um, kinds of types that live in components. So, so just this is again an advertisement for another talk, but some things are value semantic types, and some things are utilities on value semantic types. Those are two completely different categories of classes. And so there's the, the, the utilities are not instantiable. The, 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 the um, value semantic types are. And there's something in between. If something isn't trying to represent a value, but it is instantiable, then we call it a mechanism. So there's three categories. Abstract interface is a fourth category. When you see the color, they're, they're, it's sort of like a heat map. So you look at a picture like this, and when it's in color, if you're used to it, all of a sudden, you get the idea. Even if you don't know what it does. You just look at the names, you look at the colors, you look at the dependencies, and it all works. All right, well, having said that, we have some design rules. What we've seen so far are properties of components and annotations, but there's some design rules. This means really affecting your architecture. And there are two. And what do you think the first one is? It's not a property, it's a design rule. Don't do this. It's one of those. All right, no cyclic physical dependencies. It's in big font. <coughs> if you don't know what a cyclic physical dependency is, that's bad. Um, you should go look at the talk that talks about how to break them. The advanced levelization techniques show you. I have something that's cyclically dependent, Two things are pointing at each other and from separate components, you can fix that. There are nine ways to do it. Nine general techniques for doing it. The other one, no long distance friendships. So what that means is I declare something a friend that's not in my component. These two are the most important things never, ever, ever to do if you want maintainable code. Not asking a lot, really. Well, it is, because they're a little bit hard if you don't know how to think this way. It does require you to redesign, but I won't belabor that too much longer. So, anybody have any questions? That was my, uh, yes? Would you specify the uh, difference again between uh, uses by name only and uh, uses in the interface? Um, yes, okay. So, the question is, what? Oh, yes. <laughs> the question is, what's the difference between Uses in the interface and uses in the interface in name only. Very specifically, when something is used in name only, you don't need to pound include its definition. You can forward declare its class. And that's allowed for things that ha have um, what I call internal bindage, but we, we skipped over those slides. So there are certain things where a local declaration is okay, and there are certain things where it's not okay. So if things have external bindage or dual bindage, don't do that. And those are things like functions and templates. You don't want to do that. But for classes, you can do that. There are consequences and good things that happen as a result. Um, for one thing, you don't get the compile time dependency on the definition when it changes. So, okay. I'm going to throw this up while we're letting some people come in. Anybody else have any questions? By the way, that's a particularly hard thing to appreciate. And you'll find it remarkable that it's OK to return a point by value from a function. It's OK. And the client does not need to know the definition unless the client invokes the function. 
that's something to try at home. In the privacy of your own house, yes. Okay, so here's some things you might want to ask. But we didn't dwell on the one about which, which helps uh, extract physical tendencies efficiently, but actually I did mention that. That's because we can look at the pound includes. The last one. Can you guys answer the last one? What are the two most important design rules? No cyclic dependencies and no long term friendship. Yes, good. Okay, that's the big takeaway, please, if nothing else. All right, interfaces and contracts. What do we mean by interface versus contract for a function, a class, or a component? So I'm going to throw this up there. What is that? Is it an interface or a contract? That's an interface. Interface. And those are the types that are used in the interface. That little uh, white bubble with the line. See, that, that print function would have a little uh, white bubble with a line pointing to STDO stream and, and int. But we don't really worry about the built-in type, so just saying. Okay, what's that? That is a contract. We, we're, now we know. Okay, now we have a clear understanding. Right? I, it doesn't say they were good interface or good contract, just what it is. Okay, here's a class, class date. This is the public interface, right? This is where the good stuff goes. Or if you're of the mistaken ilk where you want to put the public interface first, that's okay too. The reason I do it this way is partly historical, it's partly the way it was taught to me. And it also makes clear if there are physical dependencies in the implementation, you know it. You're not trying to pretend they're not there just by putting it at the bottom of the file. They're there. So since I'm very physically oriented, I want to know. If I'm deliberately hiding the compile time coupling, you'll see one thing in the private area, which is a pointer to something else. Then you know. So it's physically driven. And also, I'm old. So this is um, a contract. It states that something true about the class as a whole. This is function level documentation. It states what's, what's true about that function, and so on. We'll be talking about these contracts in detail shortly. All right, here's a component. Component has types and free operators. And everything that's in the public interface of the class that the component defines is in the public interface of the component as well as all these free operators. And in addition, by the way, a component has a whole bunch of stuff at the top that describes what it does and gives examples and all that good stuff. But to keep it simple, this operator has a contract, this one does, and this one does. This is actually a really good um, follow-on to what our keynote was today, don't you think? Because we're specifying what we plan to do. Now, we're going to talk about how well we're specifying it, but um, let's see. So preconditions and postconditions turn out to be important things to specify, right? So for a function, let's take a look at square root. Is this a precondition or a postcondition? Precondition. Precondition, all right. And for a stateless function, it's a, it's a restriction on syntactically legal inputs. It says, yeah, I know it's a, a double, but you can't put in negative 5.2. Sorry. So that's what, that's a precondition. Now, what's this? Okay, post condition, and for a stateless function, it's what it returns. It might return it through the argument signature, it might return it directly. Right? Not, not too crazy as yet. This is where it starts to get hard. Preconditions, what must be true of both object state and method inputs? Notice I said object state. It would be bizarre to have a function that's, that's re relating to some global thing. Not impossible, but we're talking about objects, so. Uh, object state and method inputs, otherwise the behavior is undefined. And, and keep in mind I'm a library developer, so if you're an application developer, you can depend on any state you want. But, okay. So, that's a precondition. 
Post condition is what must happen as a function of object state and input if all function uh, preconditions are satisfied, all object state and input uh, uh, input if all preconditions are satisfied. Sorry, I stumbled on that. Now I want to go back to this one and ask a question. Think of vector. A little bit of a hard question, maybe not for this graph, but think of a function on vector, say vector event, that has preconditions, but that depend only on object state, not on any input parameter. Yeah, vector front. Okay, not you. Does somebody else name another one? The Say it again. The subscript, the subscript operator, but the problem with the subscript operator is that it depends on a parameter. It depends on the state, the size of the object, but it also depends on a parameter. So front is, is a correct answer to the question I just asked, and yours is a, the correct answer, or, or the correct answer to the question, name something that depends on both object state and an input argument. Size. I'm glad you said that. What are the preconditions on size? Pardon? No. Oh, sure. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Somebody think of another function. <coughs> what? No, no. Another function. We heard one. There are at least a few that are similar. Capacity? What are the preconditions on capacity? How about what are the preconditions on any const function? Okay. Remember that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a compile time syntactic constraint. I'm talking about restrictions on what you can do at runtime. I'm talking about runtime uh, prerequisites, preconditions. So we heard one. Somebody else has to come up with another. Is that Pop back is a correct answer. Why? What's the precondition? Can't be empty. Right. Now think of all the things you can't do when it's empty. So it, you have front, you have back, you have pop front, you have pop back, and I'm sure there are more. I'm not sure, but that's usually enough to get the point across. Are there more? Okay. We heard from the man. All right. So moving to the next one, this is also known as essential behavior, um, the post conditions. Now, it's more than, essential behavior is more than just a post condition, post condition is a static property that you can check by seeing what happened at the end. But the, the essential behavior is how it happens. So something like the uh, asymptotic complexity of the operation is part of the essential behavior, okay? Now, we have undefined behavior and not undefined behavior. And that breaks into two pieces itself. We have essential behavior, we have something, and we have undefined behavior. All right? Now, undefined behavior, we know anything can happen. And essential behavior, we know what's going to happen. And then there's this stuff in the middle where it's not undefined behavior, something's going to happen, it's not going to blow up, you know, the world's not going to catch fire and burn, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen. So this is where contracts are really important. To keep us out of undefined behavior, we have to stay inside the, the blue region. If we stay inside the yellow region, we actually know what's going to happen. Okay? So this is defined but not essential, uh, unspecified, and implementation dependent. Right? It could change, and you really shouldn't complain. On the other hand, in the real world, if you change non-essential behavior, you will get phone calls. Possibly from your manager. All right. So I'm going to read this to give you an idea of what might be a reasonable contract. We'll see. Format this object to the specified output stream at the absolute value of the optionally specified indentation level and return a reference to stream. If level is specified, optionally specify spaces per level, the number of spaces per indentation level for this and all its nested objects. If level is negative, suppress indentation of the first line. If level if spaces per level is negative, format the entire output on one line, suppressing all but the initial indentation as governed by level. If stream is not valid on entry, this operation has no effect. So, is there any undefined behavior? 
Yeah. All right. So does anybody think they can um, glean from this contract what would happen if they're both negative? So it's not easy, right? You got you to really like, look at this stuff for a while. So let's assume, after thinking about it for a while, that we couldn't find anything that we couldn't come up with an answer. We could suspect that any reasonable implementation would do something really quirky. We could suspect it, but that's, we could also work around it. I'm talking about for huge numbers, put it int min and int max or something crazy. Maybe, maybe it internally blows up, who knows. But who's going to do that? Well, somebody will. Well, anyway. Any non-essential behavior. All right. Well, that means that if there's some non-essential behavior, it means that you could satisfy the preconditions and still not know what's going to happen. So here's a hint. I have an if. I don't have an else. So you might get suspicious about that. What if stream is valid on entry and then it goes invalid during the course of the operation? What happens? Who knows? Doesn't blow up, but something happens. We don't know. If you depend on that, what happens? You're silly. Don't do that. Now there's something even more outrageous, which is what does this output look like exactly? Does it use commas? Does it use uh, braces? Are they curly braces? Are they square braces? You know, as, they, as it does the indentation, what does it look like? You know something about some tabbing, but what about the other characters? You don't know. And this is worded this way because we don't want human beings to code to that. We want human beings to use this for debugging purposes. If we want something to stream out in a particular format, we have utilities to do that. Or sometimes they're built right in, right? OK, so that gives you an idea what non-essential behavior is. This is important stuff. All right, now, how about this one? <coughs> create a date value, uh, create a valid date from the specified year, month, and day. The behavior is undefined unless year, month, day represents a valid date in the range 111 to 9999-1231. Does this have any undefined behavior? Yeah. What, what makes you think so? <laughs> this thing here, right? This is a good clue. If you see this, chances are, if we wrote it, that there really is some undefined behavior. Okay. So it may, there's undefined behavior. Now, how about this one? Created date value having the, uh, a date having the value of the specified original date. Does this have any undefined behavior? Another way of asking that is, this, is this a wide contract or a narrow contract? Mm -hmm. I guess it has undefined behavior if you're like passing a date that is like not in the range because it's already depending on like undefined behavior. Not sure about Okay, that. so what I just heard is somebody is not sure, but if somebody passed in a date that was created out of the right range, then maybe this is undefined behavior, but it's already undefined behavior. Uh, s sort of, yeah. Sort of, yeah, but this function is a wide contract because Anything that follows undefined behavior is undefined behavior. So it doesn't matter what happens after that. And in fact, with undefined behavior, things that would necessarily lead to the undefined behavior are also, the compiler can just delete them because it can't happen. And it can make, uh, it can remove if statements, it can do all kinds of things. So you can actually delete code that precedes undefined behavior. It's called time travel. I'm not kidding, this is really true stuff. So. Some people will argue, well, wait a minute, you know, somebody could have, could have just done it anyway, right? In, the, in this previous one, somebody might have said, uh, uh, I'm going to pass in some bad value. But at that point is where the undefined behavior occurred. The way we know this is object invariance. It says, it says right here in English, this class implements a value semantic type representing a valid date in history between the dates 111 and 9999-1231. That, that's an invariant. What does an invariant mean? What does it mean? Go ahead. It's always true. 
Okay, that's not, that's not correct. That's not correct. Had to happen once in your life. Uh, assuming no undefined behavior has occurred. Still not correct. Still not correct. It, 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 it's true much of the time. When isn't it true? Okay, let me try you. From objects? Oh. <laughs> that's, 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 not, that's not the... An invariant, no, no. The, the answer to that is no, because unless the move from object ceases to be in, in, a, in a valid state, which we haven't done yet, thank goodness. Uh, the, only, the only thing that's like that, that you're talking about, is a partially constructed thing, like an int. If an int is partially constructed and you can't access it, all you can do is assign or delete it, then yes, it doesn't satisfy the invariant of a fully constructed int. So, go ahead. During, exactly. So to be more precise, it's always true after the copy constructor completes and between calls to member functions before the destructor executes. That's what you meant by always, right? Yeah. Okay. No, I understand. It's easy to say, but it's worth pointing out. You're a great straight man. You help me both ways. It's awesome. All right. So the question is, this is the question. Be careful. Must the code itself... Preserve invariance even if one or more preconditions of the method's contract is violated. Now, this usually divides the room a little bit. <laughs> you know, say. So, this is a yes or no question, right? I worded it in such a way, deliberately, so that it has a yes or no answer. You notice, must the code itself preserve invariance even if one or more preconditions of the method contract is violated? Now, must, you could read this, must the code itself always, or must all the code in the universe preserve its invariance? In other words, this is, if there's one exception where it doesn't have to, just one, then the answer is no. If good code means that the invariants are preserved by the class, then the answer is yes. Is the answer no or yes? What do you think? How many people say no, it doesn't have to do it? How many people say yes, it must do it? Okay, let the record show that there were many more people that didn't answer the question. The second answer was yes. The third, I think one person put up their hand no. Well, the answer is no. And the answer is no for good reason. It's impossible. Let me give you an example just for, just for, for jollies. One of the preconditions I have is that you must pass in a null terminated byte string. Okay. Suppose I don't. <coughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> Some implicit things. You have to pass in an object that's already been constructed. If you pass in just blah, what am I going to do? Then there are more fun ones, like I could check it, but then I violate the contract. Like I want to do a, a, a binary search on a, a, a sorted range. Precondition, the range is sorted. Oh, wait a minute, how do I check that? Oh, in linear time. That's a problem, because the, the, the function says I'm going to do it in logarithmic time. And I can't. So now all of you people that said yes, think again. Now, there are things I could do that I'm not going to do. Even if I could do them in time that was within the contract. I could check the alignment of an object to see if it's properly aligned based on its size. I'm not going to do that because the type system takes care of that for me. And many other things. But if I, if I know whether I set it in the contract or not, uh, what happens when you pass in a null pointer? But, but, but let, let, me, let me rephrase that. If I didn't say in the contract what happens when you pass in a null pointer and somebody has the audacity to pass in a null pointer, I could certainly be within my rights to just assert, boom, you're gone. Right? I could do that. That would be fine. Because the person who's calling me doesn't know what happens when I pass in a null pointer. Now if I said if the pointer is null, no value is stored in it or something like that, then, then, then it would be perfectly reasonable to pass it a no point because the contract says that yes, that's good. All right, so the answer is no. And what makes this really important is that now we can do contract checking at runtime in the C++ standard. Probably not 17, but 19 or 20, we can do this. So this is a good thing. What happens when behavior is undefined is undefined, by the way. If anybody tries to make undefined behavior defined from the point of view of the admitted caller, they are, they are, it's a fool's errand. It, it just, just don't do that. And I want to say right now, uh, this is, has nothing to do with fault tolerance. 
this, this idea that you're going to try to somehow catch something and fix it. That's, that's, not, that's not reasonable. It's not possible to do fault tolerance unless you have something that's completely distant, like another machine in another geographic area, something over there, and then have the two talk to each other or vote or do something that's, that's much more um, uh, separate than just having oh, this happened, I'll throw an exception, and then I'll take this other code path? That's, no. And this is not about that. Even if that were reasonable, this is not about that at all. This is about, you give me something that makes sense, and I'll do what you said. Otherwise, all bets are off. That's what this is about. All right? When we are documenting, there are five things that we try to do. Um, there are five things that we try to, to accomplish, we try to cover. And the first one is what it does. So if I have a function and, and I'm trying to uh, give you the, 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 the synopsis, the first thing I have is the declaration, which in and of itself is the title of the story. And it should be very carefully worded in parameter names, function name, everything, so that once you see it, you go, okay, I, I kind of get the idea. The next piece of documentation that goes immediately below it, and I realize that we don't have enough tool support in the world. Everybody wants to put the documentation in front of it, which I cannot understand. But anyway, the next thing is what it does. And it covers every non-optional argument in the function. In the rare cases where it cannot do that, because something is controlling you so that you had to have 10 parameters or 20 parameters, then you don't try to do it at all like this. You just break from it and create a bullet list. You go to something that looks more like Javadoc. But for 99.99% of the things, especially those things under your control, this is a nice force to force you to be able in one breath to say what this function does. The next thing is what it returns. So let, let's take, for example, a vector. What does a vector uh, do for, for, uh, for what it does? Uh, in, insert an element at the specified index position. No, insert the specified element at the specified index position. That's what it does. Now, if I, for, for what it returns, it doesn't return anything, so you don't need to say anything there. But if I'm asking, you know, what, is, uh, what does size do? You don't have to say what it does because what it does is what it returns. So return the l size, return the length, or return the number of elements. Don't just repeat size. Return the number of elements in the, in the vector. Very simple. The third one, essential behavior. For the case of insert, we already learned that the basic idea. Elements at or above the specified index will move up by one index position. Right? So I'm saying something more. I'm, I'm following on from one to say the whole, the whole contract, the, 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 the post condition, if you will. The fourth one, the behavior is undefined unless. Not the behavior is undefined if. The behavior is undefined unless, so I can stack up a whole bunch of checks in a row. And you know, originally, they would have been just plain old C asserts. Then, if you look at the BSL distribution from Bloomberg, you'll see something called um, BSLS assert, which is a macro, but it's much fancier. And that's definitely something worth looking into because you can control the level of checking and you can also control what happens at runtime when something fails. But you don't put it in the header file. You let the owner of main do that. That's another talk too, but it's powerful stuff. Um, and then the last one is Note that, and note that is non-binding. It's, uh, it's just, oh, by the way, and it covers things that you couldn't make as clear as you would have liked to. So instead, you're going to uh, just sort of rephrase things, but it's not part of the contract. If you find yourself saying a note that it's essential behavior, it's no good. So you can't do that. You have to put the essential behavior in there. Nice thing about this is it normalizes. I haven't been clicking. Um, it normalizes the way in which you find what you need to know in a paragraph of documentation for a function. And the important stuff comes first. And it's in the right order. I don't know what you guys think, but I can't imagine, I, I can't fathom looking at the signature after I've read the contract. Because the contract refers to things in the signature, and the signature is the placeholder for all the words so that you can add the semantics into the syntactic thing that you try to do you know, as if you weren't going to write any doc, but then you did write the doc, of course, because if you don't, then we know from earlier today that it's unspecified. Yes, sir? Uh, 
not to belabor a slide or anything, if we want to move on and not talk about it, but like uh, the notepad just seems kind of like uneasy to me because it's it's almost like a, a it could tread into implementation territory or something. And it's like, is it something that it seems like anything that's there, if it's really something that I was interested in, maybe it should have appeared in one of those other things. Okay, so the the the, the point made is the note that is an escape hatch that might give that might give someone a, uh, a, a license to, to just not bother working too hard on the first four. Uh, as I said, if it's, if it's not a clarification or a pointer to another thing or whatever, or it's kind of like, uh, note that this behaves as if that. That's when you would do it. You describe it completely without the as if, and then you say note that this behaves as if that, that's, that's the kind of thing, a clarification. Another example, suppose I tell you what factorial is, you know, this factorial of n. And it says, return the product of numbers from, from uh, um, uh, oh, I have to say, return the product of, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to see how I could phrase it so that it's just clear enough. Uh, return the product of numbers between 1 and n and 0 inclusive, and 1 if the input is 0. That's clear, right? Now, somebody might say, well, what if it's 1? 1 and what? Does that count? What happens? So note that the factorial of 1 is 1. Just, just because somebody asks you that question five times, and you're sick of answering it. Is that okay? Well, it just seems like, like in that case, it just I would expect to see that in what it does, like at, at towards the end of that section. So. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is I'm really I, it's a rule you can't depend on you have to read the note five and then go find it in one through four for it to be binding. In other words, you this is just it, it's like it's like the contracts for dummies. That's all I can say. But it, in real life. You need to note that. Some things you need note that. Also note that. Finally note that. You do. It, it's it's you don't. It's not good. But if you don't have it, then it'll it'll wind up in some worse place. Okay. Yes, sir. Like in the, the specification for file system, a lot of times they define this operation does this, and then at the end note that this is equivalent to posit call blah blah blah. Um, I like that. That's another one. A, a, a reference to something else, even outside your code base. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. How do we, how do we verify uh, as clients? How do we verify that we're following the preconditions? How do we do that of a function that we're calling? As clients of a library? Check. Check what? Well, presumably there are things you can know. What? What do you mean by check the box? How do we figure out, as clients of a library, whether we're following the preconditions? Read the documentation. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> there you go. Oh, please. <laughs> the other one is we can assert. This is where the contract assertions come in. In the right build mode, there's, and let me say, it's worth getting on record. There are things you can't check at all. There are things that you can check at all, but not from within a function. There, right? there are things that you can just imagine that it would be remotely possible if you'd lived for the, for the universe, you know, the life of the universe, then yeah, you might be able to check it. Those are not things that we're considering with this assert thing. Then there are things that are you know, exponentially expensive. Probably not thinking about that either. Then there are things that are more expensive than the function but not crazy, like quadratic instead of linear, or, 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 or n log n instead of n, or, log n, or n instead of log n. We care about those, but you can't put them in at the same assertion level as you do when you're just having regular complying asserts. So you need at least two levels. You need the audit mode and the on mode. On mode is compliant, audit is not. Again, this talk is not about checking this stuff, but that assert refers to the contract assertions that we're ta talking about putting into the standard, just so you know. All right. This is defensive programming. Okay. We can talk about that a little bit more. Post conditions. How do we make sure as library developers that we are actually um, 
satisfying the, the post conditions given that the preconditions are, are satisfied. Yes. Excellent. Hard one, invariance. How do we make sure that our invariants hold as library developers? It's hard. How are you going to test them? It uh, depends um, if I can access the state of the... You can't, because it's an encapsulated thing, right? If you can access the state, then you're just writing in C. <laughs> special, like, make like a special mode where we can access the state. Okay, but that's... Okay, so what was, what was suggested was that we have something like a special mode where we can access the state. Either we create pound defines, like from private to public, so that we could just go right in and look at it. No, we <laughs> can't do that. I couldn't stomach it. Turns out there's a very practical solution. Okay, the, the practical solution is to assert invariance in the destructor. Because when you're doing testing, you will bring an object to every relevant state for thorough testing. Then when it goes out of scope or is otherwise destroyed, you check the invariant. Now, some people say, no, that's not good enough. We need to check it at the beginning, every invariant, at the beginning and end of every function, uh, just to make sure that the function didn't somehow mess it up. My opinion as an engineer is that is, that is uh, uh, so much effort for so little gain when all you really need to do is just check the destructor during thorough testing. Now, re remember that anybody can come in and, and mem set your object to zero. Just just bye-bye. And you can't defend against that. So that's their problem. But as long as people satisfy your preconditions, you will deliver and the invariance will hold. This is a really practical way to do it. So that's my two cents with that one. Preconditions always imply postconditions. So don't, don't ever find out that, uh, uh, oh yeah, the preconditions are good, but I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do. That's bad. The only way that can happen is if the resource on your machine isn't big enough. But you code to an infinite resource, and then if the resource is finite, that's a different story. But not, not just like, I know I said I was going to do it, but I didn't get to it, so it just, no, we're not going to do that. Must not return normally. Now, abort, throw, these are all, it's fine. As long as you don't return normally, it's good. Now, having said that, it turns out, because we're engineers, suppose you're in a company where you have not used defensive checks at all. And you have a code base that's been working for 20 years, 30 years. And then you say, you know what? This is a great idea. We're going to put defensive checks in. So you put the defensive checks in, and the program doesn't even get to main before it blows up. And that's because there are so many out of contract calls that, uh, that, that it's, it's, it's never going to happen. You know, they're, they're just whatever. You say, well, you know what? I, I know John told me never ever return normally from, a, from, a, from when I know that there's something wrong here. Just, you know, don't, don't ever, uh, don't ever um, uh, just ignore it. Don't, you know, you've got, to, you've, you've got to get from the state where I have a program, it's in production, I need to fix all of these out of contract calls, and then I can actually make it count. In other words, the, the, the assertion can be real. During this interim period, what the assertion is going to do, and it's horrible, it's going to log all of the out of contract calls in a database or in something, possibly doing a stack trace so that you can find out who called it. Then you send tickets to everybody, say, fix your code. And then at some point, quite a bit later down the road, when all of the stack traces are empty, then you replace the action from log to abort or, or something significant, like save the client's data and get out. Anyway, so I'm just pointing that out. These are two different issues. As the library owner, I should never get good, something good in and then just blow up. That shouldn't happen. I mean, except for a resource. Like, but, um, but if I do detect that something is out of contract because I'm doing the checking, in the process of getting from that bad state where we have lots of bugs to the good state where we don't have lots of bugs, I may have to bite the bullet and just log real contract violations until I can get them fixed. It doesn't seem like a good idea, but there's no other way to do it that I know of. So you have to just, as I said, be an engineer for a little while, and then you can go back to being a purist. So 
is it just if you learn production code, your library will be aborting the whole application? I'm saying yes. Okay, so the question was, does does is it okay for my library to abort a production application? So at my company, uh, for a long time, the answer was no. And then this little thing like Knight Capital came along, and um, 400 and some million dollars went away in a few minutes. And now it's like, if you don't bring it down, oh, you're in trouble. So things change. And yes, um, remember now, if you're flying an F-16 or whatever, you have three different computers written maybe in three different languages, all completely independent. And one of the computers figures out, oh, I'm screwed. It wants to die right away, so you tell the other two, I'm, I'm out, right? You don't want it to go, oh, I don't, right? Let me think, of, no, no, no. Really, not, this is not what this is about. Not what it's about. We also happen to re rely on um, on RAI, instead of trying to do all of our, uh, 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 write all of our code with tries and catches and throws, because the RAI thing works really well, and and so we don't we, we I call it exception agnostic instead of exception safe, because everything works just fine. We don't know if we're in an exception build or not. So if there are no exceptions, our code works fine, and if there are exceptions, our code works fine. I'm interested to see what the cost of exceptions is in, in your talk. All right, questions. We are running just a little bit behind. I hope I will get done by 3.30, but it won't be over by much. Any questions? Here's some questions. Always come with questions. Sir. Uh, since you said the tools aren't very good at, at dealing with low the line uh, documents, have, have you looked at trying to come up with a contract specification that works with Doxygen or JS Docs? So the question was, because we know that the tool support for comments below the line is, is much less than above the line, which seems to be a de facto standard for many, but not all languages, um, uh, uh, have we looked at trying to uh, 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 work with the, the people who are doing this, like DoxyPress, for example? Uh, and the answer is yes. Also with Clang Format. We are, we've, we've worked with Clang Format, and I need to get in touch with the people at, uh, at Google, and I spoke to Chandler, and I plan to do that as well. We also need to hire people, so this is an advertisement, <laughs> uh, uh, that are able to write plugins for many different um, uh, uh, tools that we want to use. And the thing is, a lot of the plugins are in languages that I, we don't have uh, real experience in. I programmed in Lisp a long time ago, but I wouldn't want to be writing a plugin in, in Lisp. You know, I just, does that mean, but it's a perfectly reasonable thing to try to do, and I'm trying to do it. So, yes, we would be interested in, absolutely interested in, in people who are able to improve the tool chain so that we can do what we think is the best way to write contracts. And I, I'm standing by it, and most people who disagree with that we do it this way say in a perfect world, of course it's better. We just don't have the tool support. And the bad thing is on some tools, when you click on the function, the, the, the pointer goes to the wrong documentation, goes to the wrong contract. You know, it's because it's thinking that it's above the line versus below the line. That's horrible. So we don't want that. We also don't want to change our entire way of doing business because of the tools. That's also pretty horrible. So, anybody else? All right. So, last one is narrow versus wide contracts and pejorative terms. We need pejorative terms. That's how, you know, this is the, the age of Trump and we need pejorative terms. <laughs> so, fat interface. Well, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that in the next session. We will. Um, large, non primitive interface. Wide contract. These are all pejorative terms, right? So, narrow contracts imply undefined behavior. What should happen with the following call? <coughs> what should happen? It'd be nice if you get an assertion failure. It would be nice if you get an assertion failure. I 
wouldn't disagree. It just, sorry, it depends on who you ask, I guess. <laughs> well, I'm asking. So I'm going to throw this out. How about it must return zero? Anybody like that? That's what the, uh, the VAX did, I think, a long time ago. Uh, but anyway, do we like this? What does it imply? It means that I have to put an if statement inside my function. By the way, does anybody, once I put the if statement in, is this a wide or a narrow contract? Little tricky question, but I gave you a hint earlier. Assuming you know what the contract is, go ahead. It's a wide contract. It accepts anything. Okay, does it accept a non, does it accept a non-null terminated byte string? I say, I, I, I left it there. I appreciate it. As I said, it's, it's a, I didn't even realize that this wasn't a wide contract until a couple of years ago. I, I, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying now this is a wide contract. See, it even says wide. That part, that part is sort of wide. It's not really wide. Kind of wide. But it's wider. You can say wider. Here's a narrow contract, and this is wider, but not wide. Okay. Okay, so what do you think of this? Well, the first thing is, Number one, it's likely to mask a defect. So this is purely evil. The other one is more code runs slower, even if it doesn't execute. Now that code executes on every call. We don't want to do that. That is there's planned obsolescence. That is, that is just making something run slower for, for no, no reasonable reason. Now, this is undefined behavior. That's what it is. It can do whatever it wants. That allows us to put an assert in there. And that allows us to check to see if the precondition was satisfied. And if it's not, you get your assertion. But if we take out the assertion in production, okay. Who gets to decide? The owner of main. The person who builds this thing. And remember, we need more than just assert. We need a, we need a regular assert and we need an audit assert. They're two different levels. The audit one does not satisfy the essential behavior of the contract. Okay? If it does, fine. If it doesn't, audit. Then you can say, you know what, there's something wrong with this. I want everything on, all of it. And that'll often catch some good stuff. Okay, by the way, one other thing I want to say is when you have these kinds of asserts from the beginning, they're painless in the sense that you don't have to worry about get, sending out tickets to everybody. And while you're testing your code as a library developer, you, your tests will, will go faster because the asserts will work in tandem with, your, with your, um, your test suite to help you get to the problem. So this is something we've experienced. It's a good thing. All right. Just don't pass zero. All right. Here's another one. How about um, set date int int int? Now, should this return a status or not? It should not. Hmm. Okay, we have a should not and a should. Why the should? Uh, there is no possible way to know if I did wrong. Okay, so what we said is there's no possible way to know if I did wrong. There is a way to know if you did wrong. For example, you read the preconditions and then you make sure you don't violate the preconditions. Uh, what if I'm receiving these inputs from some other module? So the point is I'm getting from some other module? Great. From some other module. So I'm calling set date. Yeah. But these parameters are being passed to me. Right, from the command line, let's say? Let's okay, oh, the command line is not some other module. The command line is some crazy human being that's had too much to drink. <laughs> okay, so right, networks over a wire. If you have an untrusted connection, y you must check that the data is valid. That is not defensive programming, that's programming. Defensive programming is when you know it's right and you check it anyway. Trust but verify. Didn't Reagan say that? You must do that. Sometimes. But when, when you know it's right, you must check it sometimes. Not all the time, because the performance will go away. So if I know my birthday, for example, I know my birthday, why on earth would I need a status? Right? I know my birthday, so I can just pass in my birthday. That's a valid date. So anyway, the point of this is, absolutely not, no return, because here's my birthday, 3859. What could go wrong? Two things can go wrong. First of all, I got the argument order wrong. 
And then I left out the year. And since I knew my birthday was valid, I didn't check the return status. And that is a double fault. Double faults are notoriously hard to catch. If I had just bit the bullet and, and said date returns void, then I could defensively check the ranges there in the right build mode and catch my problem. So narrow contracts, excellent. Wide contracts because of a status, not so good. Now, hold on. I understand that you're going um, to you're going to not like this for just a second, but you're going to like it better in a moment. You see how fast this would execute? This would just scream, right? Right now, put this in and it's going to go down crazy, like 10 times slower. Maybe more. Right? That's a very expensive operation, no matter how you code it. Right? This is a narrow contract that's checked only in debug mode. So that's this one. Now, what if you're getting something off the wire? Well, we have the if valid suffix that sits right next to the one that returns void. So it's set date and set date if valid. Now, if you're calling a function and you know that the date is valid, don't call this function. But if you don't know if the date is valid, call this function. But, but you're paying for what you need, not paying all the time when you don't need it. In fact, it's worse than that because it's when you think you don't need it, but you really do need it, that calling this will kill you. Just, okay. Do you understand why? You want to automatically turn a switch and build your program in a way during development that catches the problems during testing and possibly even in beta test. Sir? Uh, would you implement this the way you have it here on the slide or with a call to set date? Um, that's an interesting question. The, would I implement it the way I have it here or with a call to set date? Um, and the answer to that is uh, the reason I did it here was, was to show the same pattern. The reason you might do the other one, might, is to factor code. The reason you might not is the inlining depth that you're concerned about with, am I going to lose any performance with the call? So those are things I would think about. My gut tells me, because I'm my personality, because I know how hard I test things, my gut tells me for something this small, I would probably just repeat the code in place. I'm not saying that's the right answer. But you asked me what I would do. I don't like public functions to call public functions in the same class. It causes problems because you have invariants, right? You have things that get broken. So I like public functions to call private functions. I like private functions to call work on member data directly. I actually don't like the private function part. I like to go straight from public to member data, but sometimes you need to factor in, so that's what I would do. I think that's an excellent question, though. All right. Why contracts are checked in every build mode? How about this one? True story. I can't believe it's a true story, but it is. Um, uh, what should happen when the behavior is undefined? Uh, actually, the true story is coming up in a second. Notice that these, these are two very similar functions. One of them is narrow, and one of them is wide. Which one is the narrow one? Upper one. Upper one is narrow. Lower one is wide. Why is the lower one wide? It has no preconditions. There are no preconditions for the lower one. You can pass in anything that's syntactically legal. If you pass in int min, it's all good. You know what's going to happen. It's going to throw out of bounds. That's well defined. Right? So if you start to get confused, well, well no, it's narrow because if this happens, it throws. No, because undefined behavior is undefined. So it depends on the build mode. This becomes essential behavior and can never change. This, by the way, is my least favorite function in the standard. Wish it would go away. This is the one that I'm saying is a true story. What happens if I want to insert some element uh, and I'm inserting it into a container and I'm inserting it a place that's not, it's, it's greater than length. In other words, not just length. It's actually greater than length or it's less than zero. It's not just zero, right? What should happen? That so happens, I, I, uh, I had this conversation. I'll leave the names out to respect the <laughs> guilty. And, um, and I asked, I, I was on a phone conference with, with, with folks, uh, and I asked, well, what should we do in this case? And one of the answers was, well, if it's less than zero, just make it zero. And if it's greater than length, just make it length. And I was shocked at that one. That one got me 
a little bit. But the person sitting next to that person in the same office on the other side of the phone said, no, that's not right. That biases it to the ends. So he suggested <laughs> this, which, you know, get some nice random cyclic input. I know, look at that. I wish I had a picture of your face. Uh, that's what my face looked like. And, and he was dead serious. And they were arguing. And, and at that point, I realized, what am, who, what's going on here? What, what does the world happen? More code runs slower. Don't do this. Would serve only to mask defects. By the way, my entire understanding of what I'm talking about now, the, the, the genesis comes from that conversation. And I, I mean, I, from that point on, I realized I'm on a mission. So what happens when behavior is undefined is undefined. And don't try to define it because you're going to slow down your program, you're going to make it more expensive to write and test, and you're going to limit your options in the future. All right, so the answer is no, right? We do something like this. And I want to encourage people who want to do these kinds of things to look at the open source distribution that has BSLS assert in it. Uh, in fact, you should probably take a look. You can see a lot of comments below the line. Uh, good comments, I think. And we are really, we really try to be uniform about our rendering. Not just our comments, but in the style that we do things so that everything looks like it was written by one person. We really try to do that. I believe, it's hard to argue, but I believe that the total amount of value we get from not having um, a, a, a gratuitous uh, variation in rendering and in where you find things and, and just having them be, you know, not half-baked, uh, more than pays for itself in the total amount of human suffering that goes on if you don't. That's my two cents, but it's hard to prove. Appropriately narrow contracts. Now, these are, you want things to be narrow, but not too narrow, right? We don't want to make something like a landmine where if you just change one little thing, it blows up because you're out of contract. So here's an example of a function. Let's try to see what this does. This says replace starting at a given index, some value, uh, some number of elements. So, you know, the obvious thing is if I'm at the start of this, you know, I've got this thing. Let's say it's five, uh, five long. I've got this thing and I want to insert something at the zero position for a length of two. Of course that's going to be fine. I'm going to insert zero and one. I should say replace zero and one. No problem. Um, if I want to replace uh, one through five, for example, that's no problem. But what if I want to replace, uh, let's say, 2 through 5, so my, my index goes up 1 and my, uh, my length goes down 1. And I keep doing that to its logical conclusion, I get to the last element. My index is at the last element and my length is 1. Now I do it again, and my index is at 1 past the last element and the number of elements is 0. Should that be defined behavior? It's a no-op. Why would we make that defined behavior? Do you, do you see what I'm trying to do here? I'm saying, should that, that particular corner of the triangle be part of the contract, or, or should we just say, listen, if your index is, is at the end, then you know, we're, we're, uh, we're not going to play, we're, we're not going to help you. And it turns out there's some really good argument for keeping this defined behavior, because the idea is we want to not have to uh, uh, make our clients check raw input if they know that it fits in the triangle and they don't know if it's a corner, then they have to check. And more code runs slower. So look how easy it is for us to write the assertions for the replace. I'd have to write some more stuff if I wanted to check some, some corners, or I might have to do, in any event, keeping that very reasonable boundary condition in the algorithm costs nothing and may prevent a client from having to do special casing. So the idea is, no, it should be there. We shouldn't make it too narrow. It's, it's, the client might have to do a special case. We might, if, if the client is special casing, more code runs slower. Since we don't need any more code to handle it, it, it just makes sense to leave it that way, right? So narrow, but not absurdly narrow, right? But narrow. Don't start making the entire grid fine. It's not. Questions? Oh, look at this. We're actually going to get done before time, even so. All right, well, I'll give you some questions.
All right, so what do we mean by narrow versus wide? What does a narrow contract have that a wide one doesn't? One word starts with a P. Preconditions, okay. What should happen when behavior is undefined? Anything. It's all good. Anything can happen. It's what allows us to put those asserts in. It allows us to do anything. So, and by the way, I want to clarify something. There's library undefined behavior and there's language undefined behavior. When you hit language undefined behavior, there's no, it's out of control. It's out of your control. It's out of everything. When it's library undefined behavior, if you catch the precondition violation before it penetrates into the code where it can do some real damage and become um, language undefined behavior, then you can do something about it, like save the client's data and get out. So know the difference. Undefined behavior, anything can happen, but you can control, as a library author, you can control library undefined behavior. Yes? Is that, is that something that's, uh, uh, that's like a generally understood? No. <laughs> no. In fact, it, it's, 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 it's a problem because when you say undefined behavior, there's so much history about undefined behavior, people stop listening to you. So we have to be clear. I'm telling you the truth. But sometimes people don't want to hear the truth. I think Jack Nicholson said something about that once. Um, all right. So there, the, we, you, we, we talked about these different things. And what do we mean by defensive programming? I will, I will give the answer to this one at the end of the next talk. But what do we mean by defensive programming? Are we defending against, uh, uh, let's say, the libraries we use? like say ace boost bd are we doing that are we defending against mistakes we put into our own code because we're lousy programmers or are we defending against client misuse the latter the last the, the latest lastest client misuse is what we're defending against because it's the only thing that's not in our control to stop we can stop using the library we can go tell them to fix their stuff we can certainly become better at programming and testing but clients will do what they'll do. So this is our defense against misuse. They call you on the phone and they say, your code doesn't work. And you say, no, you don't know how to read or something like that. So this is just a short circuit of that. All right. And that's it. So if anybody has any questions, that's fine. And we will resume with part four uh, in about a half an hour and five minutes. OK. Sure, and I'll take your question. Go ahead. Yes, so I, I missed the very beginning of it, so maybe you answered this, but you're talking about long distance friendships. Sure. Is that thing? What, is, what did you mean by that? What did I mean by that? So the question is, what do I mean by long distance friendship? And long distance friendship is friendship that extends beyond the boundaries of a physical unit. And I'm talking about a component in particular, which is our smallest physical unit. So if I had, for example, a container and an iterator as separate classes in a component, that's fine, but, but one of them is going to be the friend of the other, so that the unit of encapsulation spans both, contained within a component. Now, as soon as you span that, you create a horrible thing. Now, you have to check the two components out in lockstep in order to make changes to the implementation, even if you adhere to the interface. And that, as the natural extension of that, is you get dependencies on remote parts of the system, and once they go beyond units of release, you know, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a ball of mud. So really don't want to do that. And it causes you to design differently. It causes you to design smaller, and it causes you to have to do techniques that you wouldn't otherwise even think of. But it's good for you, right? In the, in the, it, it, it scales. The other one does not scale. OK, any other questions? Sir. Uh, this might be a can of worms. Um, <laughs> Whenever I'm thinking of like uh, preconditions on on contracts and and uh, some of the problems I guess people run into is is uh, is documentation not being fully in line with the code, for example, mm -hmm. and, and stuff. And so it's like uh, one of the things that that always pops into my head, and I know the, the some of the problems that that occur from it, but it's like it, I still feel like oh, let's come right out and say it that <laughs> like a index well index needs to be greater or equal to zero it needs to be now negative and it's like okay well then why not in the contract in the interface why not say unsigned in why not say it in the signature i'm saying you can't 
pass in a negative. You might pass in a negative, but it's not going to be. Okay, a okay, so let me try to capture this. Documentation doesn't always get the job done because it might be inconsistent. It, uh, it, 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 might, it might be incomplete. Um, it doesn't stop somebody from making a mistake. Okay. <sighs> now, you brought up so many good things, so let's start with this. One specific thing you brought up is, why don't we just return a type unsigned and then we don't have to worry about it's being less than zero. Um, so there are many ways to discuss this. I'll, I'll take a weaker one first. Um, suppose the number that has to come in has to be prime. So we'll have a type that's prime. And any other, it won't hold anything but primes. You're shaking your head like this. It's supposed to be a joke. Oh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, All right. But, no. but seriously, if, if, if I was a library consumer mm -hmm. and and it was like, oh, I, I'm going to try to pass in this, this number here. And it's like, oh, it needs to be this prime type. And I go, oh, well, how do I get a prime type? Uh, I just. Uh, all right. Well, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me try another approach. This is actually more to the point. Um, there are things that you can check at compile time. And things like predicates on types, you absolutely want to check them at compile time and stop people from doing stupid things. And that's what concepts are. They're a set of predicates on types. A set of predicates on values, those are preconditions. People try to conflate the two and, and to cause great pain, right? So here's an example. You're, you're part of a person class, so am I, right? You have an age method, so do I. Your age can never be less than zero, clearly. No, nor can mine. So I'm happily going along thinking this is great and I followed your advice. You return it, uh, age is unsigned. I return my age is unsigned. Somebody else calls the two of us, subtracts our ages. Unfortunately, they subtract my age from yours and they get four billion. <laughs> they didn't expect that, but they got it. Why did that happen? So the starting point here is, are integers and integers mod five the same algebra? Are they? Absolutely not. Because if I add 3 and 3, I'll get 6 and 1 and 1 and the other. They're not the same algebra. So integers mod 2, those are Booleans. They're not the same algebra. What about integers mod 2 to the 32nd? Those are unsigned ints. They're all different algebras. They don't represent what you want to represent. And I believe you're misguided in thinking that you can somehow control values at compile time. That's what I think. No, I, I, and I would agree with that. And I, and I think that you made a lot of sense uh, with that. It's, it's more of a matter of, of <laughs> like, uh, where do you draw that boundary, right? It's, it's, it's it, like, you could take the, 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 the strict approach and say, uh, well, the library is correct. The person is using it incorrectly. And <laughs> okay, <laughs> so you, 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 well, you say that, but, but, but no, because, but no, because the, the, uns the thing that you're returning is really an int, and you're using a subset of integers to do it. But when you go downstream to, to, to propagate that integer into something where you have the notion of negative numbers, you're, you're I don't have to use a bad word, I won't use it, but you know what you are. Right? So we don't want to do that. So we want the, it's very important to people like Stepanoff and Struestrup and myself, and you'll get a lot of other people who do this, it's very important to keep what you're trying to do in the big picture, not in the micro picture. You think you're doing some good with this unsigned thing, but you're really not. You want to find, think about it, if you're doing generic programming, you could have a short integer, a medium integer, a long integer, a, 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 an unlimited integer. They all have the same, pretty much the same operations. Unsigns don't have those same properties. They have different properties. And so in generic programming especially, you want to use a concept, and the unsigned concept and the integer concept are not the same. So that's why I'm, you know, you're not the only one that thinks this. But anyway, yes, sir? If you were to take something like non-null, like uh, I think Dropbox is a yeah. class that they've released in yeah. it's a pointer that during the constructor has one of these checks. And then it just, from that point, you know, as an invariant, the pointer inside this is non-null. Okay. That's somewhat different than what you're saying. I think that's more like what you're... Okay, so, well, okay, so what you just said is there are examples where you can take something that would normally be dangerous, wrap it, with something that does a runtime check. But I'm advocating the runtime checks. Not, yeah, not necessarily. It would be... Uh, you have a constructor that has a precondition, this is non-null. So you take that precondition out of each of these functions that, that you would be checking it, and you move it into the type. When you oh, I understand. So what, what was said is, you want, let's say you have a, 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 a fancy type that has 10, uh, 10 constructors, and all of them take this pointer, but the pointer can't be null. Okay. 
In my world, what you would do is you would, BSLS assert each of those null pointers, but you wouldn't speak about it in the contract. You just know that there's no discussion of null pointers, and that would be that. And that has to do with one of our particular style conventions, which is a little bit off topic. Um, but you can certainly factor things. And what you're suggesting is, if I have a function here, and, it, and, and or a class here, and it calls a function many times, well, of course, you factor it into a subroutine. Or if it's used, you know, you, you have an object that does the check once, and now it's like a date. In fact, it's identical to a date because a date is a valid date. You don't have to check to see if the date is valid. I think it's a, a perfect analogy. That, that's exactly why I was nodding my head with the prime number thing, though. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I didn't mean to make fun of you, but, but the idea is that one would try to create a type that exactly matches the valid set of integers for each particular problem is, is, is not, is not uh, sustainable, in my opinion, because, because you want the type to represent the algebra, or, or the concept to represent the algebra, and then the particular object will represent the, the application of that algebra. And having a different algebra for every application would make me crazy. And then some people go further, and they have the same algebra, but they have two types for it because either it's an accident or they're trying to keep them in different parts of their, their system. That's actually a bug. The, the reason we want a, a, a date is we don't always program in generic programming. So we have to take what's called a vocabulary type, and that becomes the way we represent dates. We have one date in our company, one, and, and, and that's it. And ideally, there'd be one date in the universe. There'd be one abstract allocator interface in the universe. And finally, in C++17, there will be abstract memory resource you know, the, or, or polymorphic memory resource. And that has to be unique throughout the world. Otherwise, we can't talk to each other. So whether it be a service, an abstract service, or a concrete type, if it, if it has the same algebra, if it's really the same thing, you don't want five of them floating around. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're over by about five minutes, so I'm going to thank you all, and you can always uh, talk to me more. I hope you come back for the second half. It's not the same thing at all. <laughs>